Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and welcome to today's worship. Van Dickens here, pastor of the Monroe United Methodist Church in Monroe, Iowa. Today we begin a two-part series on what it means to live as Christians, and as a guide, we're going to take a close look at Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12. It begins by urging the Roman Christians to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. One of the customs of worship in his day was to present a sacrifice to the altar of God, a goat, a lamb, or a grain offering. Worshippers would present these sacrifices as an offering to God as well as an expression of thanksgiving and communing with, with him. One of the benefits was that the offerings were perceived as a conduit of God's grace, God's acceptance, not only of the gift, but uh, of the giver as well, also expressing forgiveness and atonement. Well, Paul picks up on this practice and tells his Roman friends rather to present themselves, their bodies, their hearts, their minds, as a living sacrifice to God. Instead of a literal slaughter of an animal, to present your life to God, you the human animal, and in surrendering to God's mercy, mercy that was dramatically displayed on the cross, we receive a blessing. And then Paul adds that when you and I do this, that becomes our spiritual worship. It's with this in mind that I call us today to worship the, the living God. Let us pray. Merciful God, we come before you today in the temple of our hearts and wherever we are. And as we do, we present ourselves to you, our lives, our hopes, our dreams, and above all, our sincere desire to live a holy life, pleasing and acceptable to you, Lord. Out of your abundant mercy, you give us Christ, who lived and taught on this earth and who showed us the way. We no longer have to bring burnt offerings. In the words of your prophet Micah, He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. We therefore present ourselves and trust that you will accept us as we are, and then, by the power of your Holy Spirit, transform us each and every day to be more like you in our conduct and in our thoughts so that the world may know who we are and whose we are. Bless us as we worship you today. Forgive us where we have fallen short. Give us courage to try again, strength to succeed. Be with those who suffer. Keep us from adding to anyone's pain. Help us to do no harm and to do all the good we can at all times and reflect the love that is Christ our Lord. For we pray in his holy name. Amen. Paul reminds the Christian not to be conformed, not to be squeezed into the world's mold, but to be transformed by the renewing of your minds, which is another way of saying to be changed, made new in Christ. And this isn't something we can do, but rather something that God does for us and in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Edwin Hatch was a 19th century English theologian. He was an author, professor of classics and church history in the 1800s, had a brilliant mind. But the average Christian may know him better today for one solitary hymn he published in 1878. I suppose it serves as a reminder to us all that you never know how you and I are going to be remembered in this world. Long after his teachings and publications found their way in libraries, long after his name sifted down into the sediment of time where all lives rest until the day of resurrection. This one hymn which he wrote when he was 43, 11 years before his young death at the age of 54, this hymn is one of the most popular hymns we have. It speaks to you and me today. Breathe on me, breath of God. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love what Thou dost love, and do what Thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure until with thee I will one will to do and to endure breathe on me breath of God till I am wholly thine till all this earthly part of with thy fire divine. 
shall I never die, but live with thee the perfect life of thine eternity. What beautiful words, what fitting words to hear as we worship that God's Spirit will fill us and renew us and remake us into his likeness, his love, his will, until others can see what glows inside us, until the day we move from this world to the next. The breath of God, the Holy Spirit, giving us meaning and purpose and the means to live each and every day of our earthly lives, to love as thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. Scripture is filled with examples of God's people living as God would have us live. In his letter to the Romans, Paul spells out what Christian living looks like. Today's lesson is from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Hear these words. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Well, there's so much here that Paul wishes to say. And we could focus on any number of these very important, practical, ethical, spiritual teachings of his. This morning, I want us to focus on the rich, fertile soil of spiritual truth we find in his words in verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The psychologist Abraham Maslow constructed an understanding of the hierarchy of human needs. It's one of the first models of human development in any high school or college psychology 101 course. I admit that what I'm about to offer is a terribly simple explanation of it, but according to his theory, each level, and there are five of them, five basic levels, at least originally in his construct, each level of needs is dependent on other basic needs being first met. For example, the most basic fundamental uh, uh, needs, according to Maslow, include food, shelter, and rest. Meeting these needs can then motivate us to look for other needs to be met, such as the sense of security and safety, not living in fear all the time, constantly. And then from this, a person can move on and, and be motivated to develop a sense of love and belonging where relationships and intimacy are critical for, for well-being. And then when a person feels they are loved and they have a sense of belonging, they are then motivated to another level, to, to develop a sense of self, some degree of self-esteem, self-respect, respect for others. They feel they can contribute to the world and they want to take pride in their accomplishments. And then the fifth and final stage in Maslow's hierarchy of needs 
is a motivation to self-actualization. That's a big fancy phrase, self-actualization. Can you say it? Self-actualization. Where you want to go on to become a fully developed person. This final stage perhaps can be summed up by the Army's old slogan, Be all that you can be. And what makes this model so popular is that it, well, it makes sense. It's easy to understand. How can a person focus on loving relationships when they are starving to death or freezing in the cold? One hot summer in 1995, after a week of field training with a bunch of Marines, I was only too eager to come home and see my wife and daughters. As soon as I entered the house, I reached out to hug my wife, but guess what? Kathy didn't want to have anything to do with me until I met one of those first hierarchy of needs. In other words, I smelled the high heavens. I had gotten used to it myself, but not her. She didn't want to have anything to do with a husband who had not met one of those first basic human needs. So I took a shower. And then I got a hug. You know, the love. So I get Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, the concept of it. It explains why students who come to school hungry find it hard to be motivated to learn. Students who don't feel safe will be hard-pressed to want to learn trigonometry or history. It's a useful tool in sociology and psychology. But there are many things it does not explain. The fact is, there are a number of people living in abject poverty, but who nevertheless attain some level of self-actualization. People like, well, Rembrandt, Vincent van Gogh. Uh, they lived in extreme poverty, but where would the world be without their paintings like Storm on the Sea of Galilee and Starry, Starry Night? Sorry, Night. Dolly Parton grew up in extreme poverty. Before her mother was 35, she had 12 children, Dolly being the fourth. Her father was illiterate, her mother often sick. Food was scarce and hard to come by, but they had something that cut through or perhaps retooled Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. They had each other, and they had God. They loved each other, and they loved God. Some people are privileged to have all the things a human could ever want or need and still grow up to be despicable. A person can have wealth, possessions, friends, family, successful careers, and climb the corporate ladder and still be fundamentally flawed. They can still be selfish, prejudiced, cruel. But if you grow up on a steady diet of God's love, if before every meal, whether it's a can of beans or steak and potatoes, you first bow your head and thank God, you're well on your way to self-actualization. If Coming home from the grocery store, having carefully budgeted that precious resources of your income, while at the same time managing to drop off a few canned goods at the local food pantry because Jesus taught you to love your neighbor as yourself. You're well on your way to self-actualization. In fact, it isn't even you who are actualizing yourself. You can be a player, a very active player, but it is God who is showing you how to be all that you can be. It's God's grace that lifts you up to a higher plane of existence. And if you know that, if you have learned from God's holy word and the example of his son to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God, then you are more actualized than all the prophets and philosophers and kings who went to their graves not knowing how much God loves them the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Paul never meant that we shouldn't learn what the world can teach. We should. We ought to. We should learn everything that our God-given brains can learn. Even now, billions of people, world over, are praying that scientists will learn how to break the code of the COVID-19 virus and unlock its secrets so that a vaccine can be developed and we can rid the world of this pestilence. But learning isn't the same as renewing. 
the power of knowledge is not the same as the power of God. In fact, according to Proverbs, the fear, that is the reverence and awe of God, is the true beginning of knowledge. The world can teach us many things, but if we give ourselves to the ways of this world, if we are conformed, squeezed into the world's mold, you and I are doomed. Much of what we see today is a result of those who are conformed to this world, to a selfish, greedy, power-lusting, lying, cheating, stealing, spiteful, hate-filled world. But God, who gave his Son, can transform our minds with a new set of eyes to see and a new set of ears to hear. You and I can live, we, we live in a time when some of the great, greatest discoveries are happening. Think about it. Today we are learning more about the human genome than all of our ancestors combined. The DNA, that, that basic chemical soup of every living thing, is, is being studied in such detail as to be able to impact the future of modern medicine and agriculture. It has the potential to lead to all kinds of benefits. But it also comes with a host of ethical questions. And it wasn't that long ago when one nation believed they could create the perfect human being through a selective human breeding program. The goal was to wipe out all inferior races, leaving the Aryan race, the master race, made up of Germans, Swedes, Icelanders, Norwegians, Danes, English, and Dutch. These would make up the new humanity, the Ubermensch, breeding among the healthiest of them all after weeding out, in other words, exterminating all who were inferior, including the Spanish, French, Portuguese, Italians. And at the bottom of the list of so-called subhuman species, they thought were the dark-skinned and the Jews. And they would be the first to go. You and I live in days of great discovery. We also live in a time of great suspicion, distrust, and evil. And it's one thing to live in this world and learn all the world can teach. It's another thing entirely to be a good person, to speak the truth, to make hard ethical decisions. As Micah would say, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Only God can transform the human mind. Only God can reach down and give us the strength and the courage to be that all we I'll be all that we can be, to change. Not to, to, to not only know the good, but do the good and to resist evil in whatever form it takes. And that through the power of the Holy Spirit. In a day when it seems that every matter under heaven is twisted or distorted to fit someone's agenda where the truth is a matter of one's own opinion and where you may choose among any number of truths, you and I must lean on our faith to see through all that fog and smoke and mirrors and false truths and discern good from bad, right from wrong, truth from false. Only God can make that clear for us. Only God can give us the vision to perceive what is genuine from what's counterfeit. Only God can transform our minds to see clearly and to set us on that path that leads to the way, the truth, and the life. Years ago, I was driving my daughter home from daycare. We were on the highway when the car in front of us rolled down its window and tossed an empty bag of fast food. Now, just that week, her school was on a theme to help clean up the world. She had learned about all the plastics being dumped in the ocean, about air pollution, carbon emissions, the whole nine yards, as it were. She and I talked about how God has made us stewards of his planet and how it's our responsibility to keep it clean so we can hand it down to the next generation. And she got another dose of it in Sunday school that week where they sang for the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, and how that hymn implies our obligation to take care of God's planet. I mean, she was well versed, let me tell you. So when she saw this careless person being a litter bug, not just throwing one bag, but two and then three, she got on the war path. I mean, she was 
furious. How dare that person do such a thing? Daddy, did you see that? We need to call the police right now. This was before cell phones and Bluetooth. We need to do something to make him stop being a letterbug. He needs to go to jail. Yes, honey, he probably needs to pay a stiff fine, but there's not much I can do about it right now. We're in the thick of traffic. Oh, she was mad. And to make matters worse, the fellow was speeding, and he quickly disappeared in the traffic. But I knew even at that tender age, God was at work, transforming my little girl's mind, converting her into something useful, something good, something, someone who was learning right from wrong good from bad, someone who is open to seeing things the way God sees them, open to, to living as God would have us live. Now, of course, she, like all of us, had a ways to go, but isn't that God's way? A little bit here, a little bit there, each day, transforming us more and more into his image. And just when we think we have arrived, God calls us to further transformation. With me, it's Patience. Ugh. In fact, the older I get, the more impatient I seem to be. If I was impatient 20 years ago, I'm even more impatient now. I want things to happen, and I want them to happen now. God, help me be more patient. Make me a more patient man, and do it now. I have a lot of things to do. I'm in a hurry, so make me a more patient man now. <laughs> you know, that's me. Earlier in Romans Paul writes, We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. And that's all things, not some, but all things. Well, if the current pandemic has taught me anything, it's how to be a more patient man. I've learned to fight less and surrender more. I've learned tolerance with those under the same roof, or roof, rough, as we say in Iowa. I've learned to allow for a little bit more wiggle room and a little bit more patience. Isn't that the way with Christians? Just when we think God is done with us, God, God stirs me in the skillet, flips me over and says, No, I think you need to cook a little bit longer to get the full flavor out of you. I'm not nearly done with you. Every day, in every way, God's at work in us, for us. For those who love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. For those who present our bodies, our minds, our lives as a living sacrifice to the living God, which is our worship. We're constantly being transformed, renewed, till the day comes when we all get to heaven, gaze on that beautiful face, and by God's grace, hear him say, you know what? I think you remind me of someone I know. Come to think of it, you remind me a little bit of, well, me. And that's not a bad thing. And all God's people said, Amen. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew That I may love what Thou dost love And do what Thou wouldst do Go in peace. May God grant you grace by the love of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And may God be with you in this day and always. All God's people said, Amen.